Hey, Scott, can you hear me? Hey, Scott, can you hear me? Testing, testing. Yes, I hear you. Okay, great. Um, an employee duck their head in the door here, so. I just love this uh, fly through. Uh. <laughs> That's right. The tantalizing uh, title there, the end of the journey. Very good, very, very well, well, uh, well worded and I can't wait to address that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, by the way, last night uh, I was watching a replay of last night's uh, Global Star Party, even though I wasn't there live. Um, fantastic, of course. Um, oh yeah, good. I, I, I loved, uh, I love Adrian's um, Milky Way of, of the Oki text. Oh, yeah, that, I mean, was, that was yeah. awesome. Oh, you did. I mean, you know, come on, as uh, Matt, <laughs> You know, as, <laughs> as Caesar would say, right? It's like that. It was uh, it was beautiful, and uh, I agree with you that with that one shot, which um, captures that uh, you know the the profile of the landscape and and the, the setup and then the red lights and of course the Milky Way and of course the um, uh, a nice meteor streaking through really captures the. Uh, it's yeah. a great title page. I agree. That's that's a that's a beauty. Yeah. Yeah. Looks like we got all the, the gang here. That's yeah. awesome. Great. I see Norm, Jeff, Beatrice. That's awesome. And yeah, we got some more folks. It looks like we got all those people. Uh, of course, Richard Grace, of course. And don't uh, never yeah. stop. It's that's yeah. Cool. Yeah. This story is as big as it gets. It's really the longest journey a human being can take. It's a journey to the outer reaches of the universe. And here's the question.
How are the tens of billions of galaxies inside this universe of ours distributed? Are they scattered randomly, or is there some kind of pattern? Margaret Geller began her quest to map the universe in the 1970s. We were limited to using a very small telescope, and it was a slow process, 25 minutes a galaxy. 25 minutes to determine each galaxy's 3D position. The latitude and longitude are easy. They come from the image that the telescope takes. But galaxies don't come with little tags saying how far away they are. And so what's an astrophysicist to do but get clever by measuring something called the redshift? And we do that by spreading the light of a galaxy out into its colors. Then we can see features that tell us how rapidly it appears to move away from us. The faster a galaxy is moving away, the more we see its light getting stretched towards longer wavelengths, and the larger the redshift. That's proportional to the distance, so that's how we know how far away a galaxy is. Now, Geller couldn't survey the entire sky. It's the classic too much universe, too little time problem. Let's suppose you were going to see the Earth for the first time, and you wanted to know, does it have continents and oceans? Well, if you take a small patch, it won't tell you anything. But if you take a great circle in almost any orientation, it'll pass through continents and oceans, and it'll tell you the Earth has two kinds of structures, both big. In the universe, of course, it's a 3D place. So the analogy is you take an orange and you cut a slice in it. So we observed galaxies in a slice of the universe. And it worked. She and her colleagues plotted the locations of a thousand different galaxies up to 700 million light years away. When we saw the data, there was this glorious pattern. The galaxies are all in very thin structures which surround or nearly surround vast dark regions where there are very few, if any, galaxies. And it was known that there were clusters of galaxies, but what wasn't known was what was the general structure of the universe. This was the first time you could really see it, patterns that extend for hundreds of millions of light years. In her subsequent maps, like this one, that went way deeper and contained tens of thousands of galaxies, the pattern held. Margaret Geller and her two colleagues had found the continents and oceans of our universe. For that moment, you're the only three that know it. That's it. Of the billions of people in the world, it's yours. And so for that moment, you own the universe. And then Geller gave the universe to the world, helping reshape not just our understanding of how matter is distributed in space, but also how that matter got there. You see, there's a kind of faint radiation that fills outer space called cosmic microwave background. It's a remnant of the early universe. That radiation has little tiny ripples in it. Ripples in temperature. Some regions are just a little bit hotter or just a little bit cooler than others. And those differences in temperature are related to differences in the density of matter of the early universe. So what happens is that gravity amplifies these ripples in the matter distribution. And so in an expanding universe, two things happen, gravity likes to make lumps. And it also turns out that gravity likes to make holes. If you start a hole, gravity will make the hole bigger. And that makes the structure that we observe today. On cosmic scales, it's all about gravity. But on human-sized scales, for Margaret Geller, it's about something else. The journeys that we take in science are journeys of the imagination. It's a measure of our curiosity and our reach. It's what makes us grand, in my opinion. Oh, I love that. I love that fabric of the universe. That's awesome. Oh, yeah.
Love it. Pretty compact, actually, you know? Yeah. Got to get as space. Yeah, uh, yeah as, large, as large as it's going to be, they really got into a nice package, like a yeah. cocoon. Well, hello everyone. This is Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific and the Explore Alliance. And you have arrived at the final episode of Cam Astronomy with Cameron Gillis. And uh, I thought it was fitting that we would uh, talk about the uh, vastness of the universe uh, a little bit and show, uh, you know, the new, I mean, really the new wave of astronomy that's about to begin with Jay West. So it's going to be so cool. Uh, you know, it's a great time to be alive, and uh, we are about to see uh, the universe again for the first time uh, with this massive new space telescope, and, um, you know, so it's, it's awesome. But likewise, um, you know, uh, exploring the universe is something that um, we all do as amateur astronomers, um, and uh, it was wonderful to have Cameron spend as much time with us as he did uh, to guide us along in his Cam Astronomy series. And so we are going to, we're dedicating a page to all of the shows um, so that you can rewatch them. Uh, and uh, so there will be a link at the end of this program that will show you how to get there. But because uh, uh, we just opened the page and we'll, we'll be building on it. Um, but you, uh, That's this awesome. is probably not the last time we'll hear from Cameron Gillis, I don't think. Well, definitely not. Uh, no way. I'm still here on this planet. <laughs> We're all traveling together. <laughs> Yep. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, thank you. I mean, from all of us, you know, and I'm sure the audience would say the same, you know, thank you for, for doing this and for guiding us along and showing people how to uh, create their own personal sky survey, you know? So it's, uh, uh, I know that you have been very inspiring to many of, the, of our audience members here as well as to me. And uh, so, you know, it was awesome. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And thank you. And then this is just like, like, uh, you know, the journey of, of any journey, uh, it will continue uh, in, in, a, in a different form. Um, you know, what, 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 you know, just as Scott said, thanks, everyone. Uh, I see all my friends, uh, my astronomy friends on online, and it's nice to see you all there. And, uh, and I really am as you can tell, I'm very enthusiastic about uh, this and I'm very happy. Thank you, Scott, for giving me this opportunity to share that enthusiasm and, and you know, help inspire. And, and I want to obviously continue to do that. But uh, basically, uh, yeah, I, like Scott said, I, I'm going to we're going to kind of put a bookend on Camstronomy 20. I'm going to continue to do Camstronomy, of course, myself personally, uh, but and I will Instead of be, uh, doing live shows, um, I am going to, you know, still be participating um, in, in and and still be actively involved with this uh, community. But uh, but it will be not so much real time. Um, uh, you know, I, it will be more of kind of um, uh, you could say, uh, you know, a, a good natural flow um, rather than a you know, an every week uh, episode. I might, I might come out with something pre-recorded, 
or I might be um, joining a global star party at some time. But uh, but for for now, um, the way my life is taking me, um, I'm going to continue this Camp Strani uh, survey. But I need to um, you know I, I need to kind of disengage from the live uh, commitment, I guess you could say, because of my the way my my routine is going between work and personal uh, and all that type of thing. Having said that. Um, this has been fantastic, and I want to give you a really good um, final episode 20 here, um, kind of wrapping up, um, you know, continuing where we left off um, in the previous weeks. But actually, I just realized when when we were going through, uh, it turns out that I'm ending Camp Astronomy 20 uh, at right ascension 23 hours, <laughs> 23 to zero hours. So it's it's uh, when I remember we're going from west to east, and it's we're, we're actually right on the uh, uh, what do you call that line? The zero right ascension. Yeah, it's the zero uh, the, hour line. Yeah, the, uh, the zero hour line. So approximately there. It's not exactly, but it's it's around there. So so I'll be basically. <laughs> yeah, so it's a, it's a it, it's a nice demarcation point. So you know, in the future, as I continue to work on my database and my my work uh, my um, uh, sky um, catalog i'm still going to make a catalog i'm still going to do all that uh but i just um basically won't be doing the live shows but that's okay uh we'll, we'll still be doing uh this and it's uh you know i again i really can't thank scott enough and this community for encouraging me and uh you know being, being very energetic and very nice and um and i i, I want to give that all back and 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 still um but I, but at the same time you know uh continue it also personally continue the journey at a good pace so that i can continue to manage my other life uh, life uh, requirements right <laughs> we all we all have commitments that we need to balance and um and uh, it this has been very very good and i want to stay stay enthusiastic i want to stay healthy uh, and balanced and um and i encourage everyone else the same you know as you're going through this journey it's it's really a personal journey that you have to make for yourself it's kind of like you see all those images including hubble images of let's say m51 or orion nebula which is of course heavily imaged but there's no substitute to doing it yourself and you know even if it's a very primitive basic image it's just a, a beautiful thing right and to be able to share that experience, of course, with with, with everyone, uh, with the, with this community, um, it's it's been wonderful as well. So, uh, again, um, let's uh, let's dive in. And um, I have uh, let's uh, let me share my screen, and um, we will do Camp Astronomy twenty, episode twenty. So let's go share my screen. Oops, this is my thank you page. <laughs> Sorry begin with end. Okay, so let's go to here. Okay. So episode 20. So we've, uh, we still have the same uh, logging, as I mentioned before, I will continue my observations through the winter, because there's, uh, there's a large constellation that has a lot of galaxies called Eridanus. Um, and it's, uh, it has um, right beside Orion. And uh, this, this, uh, these objects are going to continue to increase. So I will do to continue this camp astronomy and continue my visual observations. And uh, but together, we've observed, um, we've shared the 263 sky survey images of 172 objects. And today, to kind of close uh, this chapter, um, we're going to do 29 new images uh, of 20, 25 new objects. So we're going to go like a double episode, a double feature, if you will. Uh, on top of that, uh, you know, I, 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 like I mentioned, final episode of Cam Starting Live, but I will continue to provide updates offline. And I love this community. Uh, I consider, you know, many of you friends, all of you friends uh, who've, who've been participating, and it's been such a, a very inclusive uh, group. And uh, again, uh, I can't thank Scott enough for um, helping me. And, and now Steve, who used to be known as Book, uh, I want to call him out, <laughs> and Jeff Wise. Um, you know, there's lots and Pekka, Beatrice, uh, Norm, Martin. Uh, you know, Astro Beard, uh, Richard, Grace, all you guys. So, um, so we ended up with M15. So let's go to the um, 
let's go to the uh i'm sorry that's uh here we go so m15 we in the very far west of uh, pegasus globular cluster very nice and i'm in equatorial mode right now uh, because i've switched over from my altazimuth to my um, nexus 2 to pmca so that was another thing that i've been doing uh, in the in the past couple of months and i'm very happy to say i'm becoming very successful at it um, in my journey and more to continue. I'll give you an update at the end of the show. Um, so we got, uh, we're going to go off to uh, Messier 2 in uh, Aquarius. We're going to start to go into um, Aquarius now, go a little bit south. So let's go. Uh, here we go. So M2. So here's my image uh, I took on in July. And uh, you can see very nice, beautiful globular cluster. And by the way, many of these globular clusters uh, and, and many of the Messier objects, I, I recently uh, got a new set of uh, 8 by 42 binoculars. And um, while I'm setting up and while I'm doing my imaging, I, I point the binoculars up and kind of look at all the, uh, the brighter objects. And it's so fun. To be, I was looking at M15, for example um right off so i just took the two end um stars at the end of pegasus and went off to m15 and then i went uh, i also took a look at um, um the andromeda galaxy obviously uh that was beautiful in the binoculars i looked at uh, i actually looked at uh, the dumbbell nebula over here in sagitta that's pretty easy to find you just look at these uh, this arrow uh the sagitta constellation and then just this kind of a uh, triangle of there's a little triangle it makes uh, with these two stars. And then I also took a look um, at M13 in Hercules as it was setting. And that's beautiful because you can actually see in the binoculars, you can actually see these two stars here to make that, that classic uh, triangle with the two stars. You have the M13 and the two stars. So that, that's beautiful. So, um, so just keep it looking up. That's what all I can say. So now we go. Um, so continuing along, so M uh, Messier 2, Gilbert Cluster and Aquarius, magnitude 6.5, quite bright. And if I look at the um, specs on that guy, it's pretty far. In the, remember, Gilbert Cluster is in the 10,000 light year range. So 38,000 light years away, quite a bright object, easy in binoculars as well. Um, but the hard part about um, M2 binocular wise is um, it's kind of in a sparse, sparse star field. So you'll have to, Look at Aquarius and kind of triangulate it from these two stars here to kind of get find out where you are. Or you can go when you find M15, you can just kind of pan down and then use that. But it's a it's a beauty, uh, nice uh, globular cluster. Uh, the next one is Saturn Nebula. So if we go, I'm going to zip down here. Let me zoom in. So in the far kind of getting to the western part of Aquarius. Saturn Nebula 7009, magnitude 7.8, super bright. I mean, this thing is like really bright. Um, easy to see, beautiful uh, object. It's uh, around 3.2 thousand light years away. So that's, you know, in thousand light years is about right for anything within our galaxy neighboring arms. And uh, if we look at the picture, this is my first picture. And you can see this is actually through the trees. There's some trees, uh, Saturn Nebula. If you look at where it is on the horizon here for me, um, when it, I took this picture back here, so if I go back in time, when it was rising uh, in the southeast, and basically there's some trees there for me, and uh, but I couldn't wait to take a picture of it. So here's what you see. You know, this is what you can expect if you're taking a picture of an object. But it's amazing that even through trees, you can uh, <laughs> pick something up. You know. Um, and then here's a better picture when it was clear, uh, cleared out, uh, quite very high surface. But if I zoom in, what's interesting, if I zoom in and actually I have another zoom in coming here, you can see the ANSI, um, uh, the two end, end uh, pieces, which make it the classic Saturn nebula. So this is a zoom in of the previous picture and, uh, it's really neat. But it's you'd have to play with some of the exposures, which I I haven't had time to do. But uh, if you do different levels of exposure, you'll see more internal structure uh, on this. Uh, it's just that I I had to do this was I think a 10 second stack image, 
and that brings out the ANSI. But if you do like uh, even shorter exposures, because it's so high surface brightness, it blows out, it fills your uh, your um, sensor wells pretty fast. So um, if you do shorter exposures, you can get the internal structure. Um, oops, sorry about that. And uh, getting back to here. Next one is M72. So if I zoom over here, so M72 in Aquarius. This is the east, uh, the westernmost object in the globular cluster. This is again in the trees when I first took it, and you can still see it. But if I go with the later image, uh, much better. Uh, you can see this one here compared to the earlier M2, obviously, uh, much fainter. Even though it's a Messier object, uh, I wasn't able to see this with the binoculars. But um, if we take a look at it, let's take a look at the brightness here. So we go. Yeah, it's magnitude um, it's 9.2, right? So that's that's definitely uh, getting beyond the binocular range. So basically, uh, but 55,000 light years away. Um, so it's it's noticeably um, uh, fainter and more distant. But you can see some uh, with a higher resolution, uh, with a larger aperture telescope, you can start to see the granularity very clearly uh, because it is fainter and it's pretty um, pretty small. Then we move on to Capricornus. If we zoom back out here, go. Okay. Yeah. And of course, uh, Jupiter and Saturn, visually, I was enjoying um, them in between uh, while I'm taking this. It's, they're in prime position right now. They're really, really good. So if I, if I move out forward in time, see here, zoom over here. Yeah, so if you're in this, definitely take a look at, oops, let's go back in time. There we go. Yeah, when you're in this region, you definitely have to take a look at the Jupiter and Saturn there. They're really nice. They're pretty high. They're, they're, they're low for me. I mean, if you look at the, off my horizon, Saturn is about uh, 19 degrees off the horizon. So it's still not very good, but at least, um, at least they're, you know, it's, it's not too bad. And they, of course, with, even though there's sky glow down there, uh, it's, it's, um, no problem with the, with the planets. But when you look at some of the objects like M30, one of the more southern Messier objects, let's take a look at it. So you can see it's, it's pretty small. Um, the, the magnitude seven. So you probably could pick this up with some binoculars. Uh, 26,000 light years, so it's a bit closer. But it's interesting because it's it's brighter, it's more intense. But you can see compared to M72, uh, it's a, it has a similar structure in terms of uh, the core and the uh, and how it um, you know the granularity that you'll see through through a telescope. Um, and then if I zoom back out here. We move back into Aquarius, so we, we just dipped into Capricornus. Capricornus has some other fainter galaxies, but um, uh, they didn't make the cut with my astronomy survey. The only object in Capric Capricornus uh, that made it was um, M30. So now we move on to the Helix uh, or the Helix Nebula in Aquarius. And this is my first image back in October. Uh, I didn't, uh, I kind of threw my Altazimuth together and, and it's like okay let's take a quick image but while it's up because i didn't have much uh much clear skies in october uh, or so far but i got it i barely got it here um you can see some of the color and the double the, the, the double helix uh here structure and then this is uh an image i took um with my equatorial mount um uh, just the other other day uh 10 7 october 7th um, the longer exposure, you can see a little bit of left-right motion because of periodic air. I don't have a, uh, and we'll get into that later on in the show, but I don't have a, um, a guiding, an auto-guiding uh, uh, scope to, uh, to correct for the periodic air. Uh, so I'm limited to still about 30 seconds. Uh, but what's nice about this picture, I mean, you can see the amplo. I didn't use calibration frames. You can see the vignetting. 
and you can see the dust mode. <laughs> so, so I'm kind of I went backwards in terms of imaging for a short time to kind of focus on making sure I got the equatorial workflow and the polar alignment figured out. But I was able to get this picture of the helix. What I'm, it's not awesome, but I'm I'm happy with because uh, you can see even some yellows and greens. You can see the double double helix structure. You can definitely see the blue uh, central star. Um, and, you know, definitely room for improvement, but um, it's all part of the journey. Um, and if we look at the helix, uh, or helix nebula, it's a magnitude 7.6. So it's quite bright from an absolute magnitude perspective. But what happens is it's very diffuse. So you do see it as a ghostly glow visually. And if you're lucky, you'll see, you'll see, um, you know, looking at this image, you will see a little bit of brighter areas on these two sides and you'll see this ghostly thing and you'll see that's kind of what you'll see visually. Uh, you'll see a kind of a large ring. It's a very large object close by though. Look at that 790 light years. So we're uh, one of our nearby neighbors. That's kind of cool. Now we're moving to the far to the galaxy area. So 7377. Let's take a look at that guy. 7377, look at that, it jumps up to 160 million light years away, magnitude 11, so uh, quite a bit further. And if we look at the uh, picture, 7377, so here's my image. Uh, again, I, I, I snapped some of these guys pretty quickly um, with my with my uh, altazimuth in this case. Um, and um, you can still see some of the, the you can see very clearly uh, the central core. Probably with a larger exposure, you can see what you probably would pull out the uh, spiral arms on the oval. Um, next one. We dive in, let me move forward in time here. Now we're in Sculptor. So this is getting to Maxi and Caesar's territory in the southern. Uh, this is as far south I can go. And still eke out something that makes the cut in terms of the camp astronomy size survey. So, so basically, I went down. This is only 13 degrees above the horizon, and 7513. It's a magnitude 11.8. Kind of a challenge object for us uh, in the northern hemisphere. Um, 52 million light years uh, away, so it's pretty close um, in terms of galaxies. And um, I'm sorry, I was. Uh, 7513, sorry, 7513 is right here. And what's interesting about the image, when I compare the, uh, you know, it's 11 magnitude, 11.7, and 52 million light years away. What's interesting with the image, you can see from the visual plates, obviously, the two stars here clearly, and then you can see this kind of uh, oval edge on here. But there's another galaxy down here, which is, uh, it seems to be brighter at least photographically, which is interesting. That's why they have photographic and visual magnitude, I guess. Um, I, uh, what's interesting, and I, I wasn't able, this guy didn't make the cut. Now it's possible. Let's take a look at him since he's right beside. I zoom in there. So that's 7507, magnitude 10.4. See, that's brighter, but for some reason, let's take a look here. See, 81 million light years away, further away, but brighter in magnitude. Um, this is an example of where I might want to go back visually, uh, now that I picked it up phot photographically, and it seems to be quite a bit brighter than the other one, and then redo my uh, Camstronomy catalog and add this to the list, for example. Um, so so those, this is part of the fun, is you, you as you start to kind of go back and forth between visual and photographic, you start to see other things. You 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 pick up things that you might have missed uh, both ways, and then and then you start to uh, come up with a better a better um, um, I guess you could say internal um, comprehension of what you're what you're seeing. Um, so that 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 that's one that I'll definitely go back to because it's clearly uh, I think it would be quite a bit brighter than the other one. So check that out. Let me zoom back out. Now we're gonna go back up. That's as far south as I'm gonna to go today. And if we go zip back up into 7727, now we're on the far eastern part of Aquarius. 
just a little bit of light here. So 7727, it's a fairly bright magnitude 10.6. That's pretty bright. And uh, 84 million light years away, kind of average. Um, and if we take a look at the picture, yeah, here we go. A classic, you know, uh, central oval and um, in a nice star field with a pretty good, uh, well defined core. The next one. Now we're going to go back up 7585. This is the last galaxy in, in Aquarius. Magnitude 11.5. Whoa, quite a bit further. So it's interesting again, twice the distance of the last galaxy we saw, 160 million light years, yet a, a roughly the same magnitude, 11.5 huh. uh, magnitude, which is really neat. So if you compare it now, now here, you can see similar structure. Um, there's another fainter galaxy off to the right here. Let's take a look at that guy. I always like to do that. I'm easily distracted by other galaxies. <laughs> so here's a magnitude 12.9, see, 7576. And let's take a look how far he is. He's 170, so he's pretty close uh, in terms of distance uh, of these, with these two. These guys are in the same kind of structure when you look at those that earlier uh, video where you see the, the kind of the structure of the universe and how the galaxies are clustered together. These guys are kind of neighbors in terms of that. Um, and so, but it was interesting, he didn't make the cut. Looking at the bit, the picture, it looks like they're almost the same. Clearly this is brighter, 7585 is brighter, but visually um, it would be interesting to compare to, to see if I can still eke out this magnitude 12.9 uh, galaxy that's close by. Okay, now let's zoom back out. Well, as we go back up north, we're gonna go. We're gonna zip through Pisces, and uh, I just wanted to pick up seven seven five six two here in Pisces. Magnitude eleven point five, and if I look at the uh, specs. 170 million light years, again, same same type of range, 11.5. And if you look at the picture, this guy's nice. Uh, he's he has a there's a lot of there's some other galaxies that are close by. Um, if I zoom in a little bit, probably if I take a longer exposure, you might even be able to eke out the spiral arms, um, which would be kind of cool. So I'll, I'll definitely be coming back to this guy, and uh, and doing more observations and more more imaging for sure. Uh, and you can see that here's a galaxy. Uh, this one up here comes up. Some of the other ones don't show up, these guys that are down here. So let's take a look at this guy right up there. So let's see if I can get him. Let's zoom in. Does he make it? Oh, no. Okay. Let's uh, change the magnitude limit just for, just for kicks. Um, deep sky. Let's go a little bit more. Magnitude 14, okay. So here's an example where this guy here shows up photographically, 7557, right? So this guy here, 7557, and he is, let's take a look at his specs. Magnitude 14, so beyond the scope, of, uh, beyond the visual range of an eight inch stromacassogram, but pick it up uh, uh, you know, photographically, and obviously with a longer exposure, it'll come out easier. But he's 180 uh, million light years, so he's kind of still, still a neighbor, relative neighborhood on the same continent, if you will, uh, of that filament, of the galaxy filament structure there, but quite a bit further away, or this is quite a bit fainter, I should say, and smaller. Okay, let's go back out. Next one, let's go back. Uh, now there's a couple of nice uh, galaxies, sorry, uh, galaxies right on the border. And Pegasus at, at the bottom of Pegasus on the southernmost part. We're going to go into those guys. And uh, there's a nice little cluster of galaxies actually around here. This is a really cool one. And if I look at, I want to look at the picture first. So, so here, here, uh, this is a nice visual field, uh, and uh, and also nice photographically because you can see from the photograph. First of all, these 
two galaxies, 7619 and 7626, come out really clearly. But you also see some of these other ones, like this one over here, this one over here, one up here. There's a whole bunch of juicy galaxies around. Here's another one. So this is a beautiful, a beautiful, uh, and it's also kind of looks neat, uh, you know, uh, from an image perspective. So with a little more, you know, technique, here's another one down here. Not that I barely see this guy here. I won't click on them all, don't worry. But uh, it, it, but you can see this would be fun to explore. So let's uh, let's just take a look at 7619, 7626. Um, 7619. I remember when I first saw this visual, it's like beautiful because these guys pop out really easily. And then if you're lucky, you can pick out some of the other guys. So let's take a look. 7619. Magnitude 11, 170 million light years away. So in the, in the same fabric, let's go to 7626. Magnitude 11.1. .1. So these, again, quite bright galaxies. Um, 140, so 140 million. So this guy's getting a little closer. So he might be on a different part of the fabric, but he's um, he's still quite bright. But these guys look like twins. And if we look at the, uh, just pick out, let's just pick one of these guys, like this guy here. 9213, 7631. Let's take a look. He is 180 million light years away, so a bit further away. Just gonna take a drink here. <clears throat> so so there's a, this is a fun little group to explore. Okay, next one. Let's zoom back out. Usually these types of galaxies that are out here are, are often overlooked or neglected because they're in very um, sparse star fields. So they, they're not easy to star hop to. Uh, but now with go-to technology and, and, and such, it's you know, a whole new, whole new possibilities are there. And if you know the orientation and you know following along with, with this, uh, you can see, you can discover these nice little groups, which is really really nice. Um, kind of rediscover them. Um, seven four seven nine is the next one we're going to do. Nine into ten point nine, so quite bright. Check them out. Ah, within a hundred million light years. Oh yeah, this one is a beauty. I love this one. Seven four seven nine. This is one of those nuggets you kind of go through your survey, and I was like, whoa, this is a nice one. Well, you can see from this picture, beautiful, beautiful. Take a look. This is my picture, and um, nice. I was just so ha I was so happy. This is my first picture, and then this is my next. The kind of oh yeah, outlet. I've seen this one before. Yeah, this is good. the one I showed you before, and 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 this was so nice. You know, yeah. seeing this, and if you zoom in, you can actually see some structure in in the bar. Structure. That's true. And, and how it wraps around. It's like oh man, I just I I always love bar galaxies and to be able to do that with my own equipment it's like this is so cool um and so here it is and uh obviously a nicer image but but it's so cool it's not it's within 100 so magnitude 10 point when you see this visually though you won't see you you'll see the bar part but it's very hard I, you need a larger scope obviously to see these but but if you do have a large an opportunity to see you could peek through a larger scope check out this guy you're going to see the arms for sure it would be beautiful just yeah. delicate, you know, it, it would be a really beautiful visual object. Um, oops, sorry. Um, okay, let's go back to the, here we go. Yeah, so then we move up to these pair of galaxies, 7448 and 7454. And uh, let's go, here we go. Yeah. So what I did is I, this is another one of those kind of nifty fields where you have some neat uh, multiple galaxies in the same field of view, which is always fun. Um, so if we take a look at the, what they are, so let's zoom in a little bit more. Here we go. So seven, four, let's do seven, four, four, eight first. 90 to 11.5. Again, these are quite bright galaxies. It just, a lot of them are covered in a little bit remote areas, but you go look for them and they're, they're really rewarding. Um, 140 million light years away. And then 7454. 
let's click on it. Just a little bit of a lag. There we go. Now he's 11.8, and he is well. See half the half the distance. Isn't that interesting? So 77 million light years away. So closer but fainter, which is really interesting. Um, so now and then there's another galaxy down here. Let's see which one. Uh, go back to the PowerPoint. 7463 right here, just for 7463. Magnitude 13.2. So it's just beyond visual, mm -hmm. probably, uh, of an 8 inch. Um, 74 million light years away. So he's close to the fabric. He's close to the area of the 7454. Um, but he comes out kind of neat. And I love it when they have these slightly edge on. You can see a little bit of modeling uh, as well. So that's a, that's a nice field. Um, next one is, let me zoom back out. Now we're going to go, so you, again, reorientating ourselves. Here's the square of Pegasus. So we, we just came up from down there. Now we're in the corner. So that's an, these are easy to find, right, from the, the, the south, um, southeastern or sort of southwestern uh, star in uh, Pegasus square. So if we go back up here to the northwestern, uh, there's 7457. Let me zoom into that guy. And he is 92, 10.9, so quite bright. And look at that, 46 million light years, so really close by. So this is in the trees. I got again very anxious and I couldn't wait to you know, start imaging it. And then I was like, okay, let me do it again. So this is uh, one later on where I cleared it out. And you can see there's actually a little bit of structure, which is interesting. Uh, so with a longer exposure, that would be a fun one. But visually it's nice because it has that, you can see that fainter. I think that's still a star uh, there. I don't think it's a Nova, <laughs> but uh, yeah. basically you, you <laughs> never know. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's true. You never know. I mean, you that's never know. why it's you like, keep them. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, but it's, it's, it's cool, right? I mean, uh, it's, it's nice to see that. So visually you can probably see that um, just off to the side and, um, and there's a nice star field. So that's, that's a fun one. Um, and it's close by within 50 million light years. So zoom back and out. Now, if I remember correctly, now we're going to go to the middle of the square down here, 7625, moving from west to east. So 7625, 83 million. So it's kind of in the middle now, um, 12 magnitude 12.2. And let's take a look at the picture. 7625, yeah. So fairly distinct, um, nice round. And you can even see some hint of some spiral arms. So again, if you if you take a longer picture of this guy, because you can see he looks like he's faced on, um, probably uh, you can you could eco some spiral structure. That would be kind of cool. So, but visually, this is kind of what you'll see uh, with the core. Moving along, seven seven one one on the right on the bottom edge of the square, and we zoom back out, back in. I should say. So he's magnitude 12, whoa, 200 million. So he's the winner so far. Furthest galaxy so far, 200 million light years in another, another quadrant of the, of the universe. Um, 7771, here we go. And here's what he looks like. It's kind of a, a, an edge on disk or an oval. And you can see only the core in the, in the image here. Again, it would have to take a longer image, longer exposure to probably eke out some more uh, modeling. Probably a very dusty galaxy, just judging by the, um, the fact that you can only see the core, which is interesting. Um, okay, next one is seven seven four two. Let's take a look. Uh, now we're going to dip down again to the south. Seven seven four two, magnitude eleven point five. Take another drink. Eighty one million light years. Hmm. So he's in the in the middle of the uh, attack, so that's that's good. And then if you look at the image, uh, you can see the seven seven four two. Yep, very very distinct, uh, very clear. I don't know if this is a phase on or if it's just an elliptical galaxy. It looks like it's more of an elliptical galaxy. Looking at this, the large core by the star, which but it's always nice when there's a galaxy 
right beside a star, you, so you can really pinpoint it literally. <laughs> um, and then you can see uh, there's a star just off to the edge. It's this one right here. Um, when you, because of uh, internal reflections, uh, you, you 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 get this little bit of a artifact. Uh, so probably, I know we talked about this before, Scott. If you go in and look at your image train and look at all your little your uh, your screws or anything that's in that could cause a reflection, um, that that would help eliminate that type of artifact. Um, but it's not it's still not bad. It's this is uh, I, I, if I just move it a little bit away. Then oh, this I goes away. Yeah, right. but you you can see it's just outside the field of the, the sensor. Okay, and then uh, seven seven four three. Close the magnitude eleven point five. Sixty one. So he's getting closer. Look at sixty one million light years away. Magnitude eleven point five. And if we look at him, yeah, a little bit of a if we. There is some looks like there's some spiral structure. In fact, you know, looking at the, the orientation and the oval, I maybe I'm imagining things, but this might be a barred galaxy. Um, <laughs> I can see a little bit of an elbow here, but again, that's just my the way my eyes work. I, I, I pick up these extremely faint fuzzies, and, and this would definitely be worthy of a, a longer uh, exposure to really eke it out to see what kind of structure you can see. But that's 7743. And 7743, we already found out it was 60 million light years away. Now we're going to zip back up here to, what are we going to do next? 7, 8, yeah, 7814. So 7814, magnitude 10.5. I love those nice juicy galaxies. You know, they, once you get into magnitude 10, you know, it's, it's very bright, very easy to find. Um, over there. Oh, look at this guy. See? Really cool. Nice little dust lane, but let's see. Within 50 million light years, uh, 47 million light years away. Now, this is cool. Look at this. Zoom in. You can see the dust lane. Isn't that cool? Mm. I love that. I mean, this is not the best of yeah. images, but it's so cool to pick up that dust lane. I'm like, this is so awesome. And, yeah. and visually, um, That's... I can't remember. What's yeah, that? Many galaxies look like this visually, you know? Yes. If you're, if you're a careful observer and you're in dark skies, you can start to see these dust lanes. And especially if you've learned averted vision, which is a technique that uh, Cameron knows well, you know, from having a big scope and looking at faint fuzzies. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And, and you, you keep on looking at, you compare it to other stars, you, you focus in and out, you, 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 you know, and then finally it's like, okay. And uh, what's nice is you you try uh, best is if you have par focal eyepieces, you can kind of try different images. And sometimes going higher magn magnification really helps um, a lot uh, to really pull out the um, that sky that make the sky dark background uh, darker, uh, and that will help you with your averted vision. Uh, so so I I like to actually pump up the power. Um, sometimes, especially with galaxies. Um, okay, let's go to seven seven six nine. So this is a nice nugget. Seven seven six, and that one's in the that's in the southwestern uh, corner of the Pegasus. Now we're going to go to the middle again. Seven seven six nine, and that guy. Let's zoom in here because it's a bunch of galaxies. Yeah, so seven seven magnitude eleven point seven. Uh, 200, whoa, another another record. So he's like right in there with the other guy, 200 million light years away. And magnitude 11 points. And look at this, this is nice. Another nice little field. You can see this galaxy here, 7769. And then you can also see this other one, which is kind of edge on, or not a little bit tilted towards us uh, with another companion galaxy. And you can pick those up uh, on the photograph or on the image. And if we zoom in, I didn't set the threshold, but let's just click on this guy. 7771, magnitude 12.9. 210, so he's a neighbor, 210 million light years away to these guys. So these guys are pretty close to each other, only 10 million light years. And 
and uh, that means they could see each other. And there's probably this little companion looks almost like a, it would be like an Andromeda galaxy to us type of thing, right? But this is 10 million light years away from the, from each other. And uh, probably visually, I think this is what's nice is when you have a brighter galaxy in the field and then you have a slightly fainter one, it's a good test for your vision as well. Because when you're looking at one galaxy, you're creating an averted Im image averted division on the other galaxy. So it kind of, they both pop into, and then you move off to the side and you can see, you may you see them both. Uh, but this one's on the limit of my eight inch, uh, this, this uh, 7771, uh, this guy here. Okay, let's zoom back out. Moving along, we're almost finished the sky survey of this portion. 7768. So that guy's magnitude 12.3. Whoa, 390 million light years away. Okay. That's far. That's far. And you know what's really cool? Look at that. It has some friends. Uh, you, you know, there's a lot of neighbors here. I, I pumped up the magnitude a little bit. There's a whole bunch. So this is actually a little, little galaxy cluster. So if I look at the neighbor right here, Magnitude 14. This is the brightest neighbor. C390. So these guys are all in the 390 million light years. So if you take a longer exposure, you could actually, if I zoom in, you could just see these. Look at that. Look at that. Actually, see this chain here? There's that chain. Hey, they're everywhere. You can see, you can actually see them. Of course, they look like stars, and this is a JPEG compressed, uh, you know, artifacts. But you can see that this chain here is actually galaxies, not stars. And if I take a better image, you know, at a better image scale, you can, you can actually eat these guys out and make sure that, yep, they're galaxies. So that's really cool. Um, yeah, I like that. Okay, let's zoom back out. Okay, now look at this. We're going to pass the zero hour. So we went from the 7,000. So remember the NGC objects go up to about 8,000. Uh, and then, then you start from zero again. So now look at this. This is a this is the last two galaxies right on the edge. They're literally on the, the western edge of the, the great square of Pegasus. So NGC 16, or magnitude 12, 150 million. Yeah, we're getting back down to near uh, 150 million years. So it's a nice, it's a nice distinct oval. There's some other galaxies in the field. You can see this one here, this one over here, barely. Uh, but basically, um, there's NG616, pretty good uh, star field as well. That's a nice one. And NGC23. Magnitude 12 again. And this guy is 170 million light years away. And that's this image here. So another two galaxies that you can still see. See, you see there and there. And there's, there's the galaxies right there and there. Or no. Uh, there and there probably but um there's a nice star again hey maybe i discovered multiple no I yeah <laughs> I, I have no illusions it's it's, it's cool uh it, you know but it's neat uh, you know it, it, the neatest is when also when somebody else discovers it and you can actually do it yourself right and find it rediscover it first so that's really cool um so uh, we have the we have the technology we have the capability and we have the enthusiasm uh, to do this, uh, it's it's really fun. Um, so that's another galaxy that has a nice star that's right close to it. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, so now we're gonna switch gears. I'm gonna take um, uh, a quick uh, quick break here and uh, switch over to uh, what I've done. So that's that's the end of the survey. As far as um, kind of astronomy sky survey that I'm gonna be uh, publicizing live, um, we're gonna we stop right here. So basically, our boundary. I turned on the boundaries. We 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 boundary. Our boundary is Cepheus, um, uh, La Certa. Um, you have Pegasus here, part of Pisces, and Aquarius, and then part of the, this part of Sculptor. So basically, around around the zero hour line is where uh, where we stopped with the camp astronomy 20. I will continue, of course, uh, I will continue to do this. I will put everything in, in PowerPoint. Uh, and I'm going to, like I told you all along in my journey, I'm going to make a catalog 
and I will publish that at some point. Don't know how long it's going to take, but uh, I will tell you I will be enjoying the journey as I go. Um, and speaking of that, part of that enjoyment is, uh, of course, the equipment uh, and the uh, using uh, getting getting really optimized with my gear. So I wanted to share with you guys uh, my latest on this. So I've made some great progress. Uh, Give me a second here. What's going on? Oh yeah, sorry. Okay. So what I have is I've taken the same setup, uh, imaging setup as I had before. I won't go through all the details on the image train, but it's the same image train as I had before um, with a 294 and ASIR Pro. But what I've added to that and with my C8, uh, what I've added to that is the uh, Exos 2 with PMC8. Um, and what I uh, and to make the Wi-Fi better on the ASIR Pro, I added my own Wi-Fi router. But the key thing, what I've done and I'm very happy about, is I've, I've tethered the, uh, the Exos 2 PMC8 to the A ASIR Pro. I've showed this in some other videos before. They were not very good videos, but let me just tell you uh, that I got it working. <laughs> um, and and it's it's very nice. Um, Basically, what you can do in ASI in the ASIR Pro app is you can control the PMCA completely through that. Uh, and and the, the the number one thing after Scott showed me the drift alignment and all that, uh, I can actually use the ASIR Pro app to do uh, polar alignment. There's a polar alignment app inside the ASIR Pro that, when coupled with the with the uh, Exos Two. Uh, with uh, with any mount for that matter, um, it will actually help you polar line really fairly easily uh, with, by by taking images through your camera and do plate solving, and then basically you can adjust the alpha azimuth similar to uh, drift alignment. So knowing the drift alignment is a really good as well if you can't see the polar uh, um, star, but um, it's the same basic technique. But the difference is you have the aid of the, the camera to, to, to do um, uh, plate solving for you. Um, the way I got it working is you need to have this, uh, I got this OP1 or whatever, OIC1 USB. It's an FTDI chipset, uh, USB2 to DB9 serial cable. That's the key. And then beauty of all that, once I got that all working, is uh, now I just need one tablet because uh, I used to have my one tablet using controlling the imaging system and the other image controlling my uh, my mount. But now everything goes through the same interface, which uh, makes it nice and clean. Um, so I have one tablet. And uh, let me just show you some stuff. So here's this is just a quick uh, Im image um, of Jupiter. Uh, no, no, no live. Uh, if like this is not live stacked or this is not lucky image or anything like that, but I'm pretty happy. That this is just um, this has, this is just uh, using the ASI Air app, the focusing mode, which zooms in, and you can see the belts and uh, you can see some structure a little bit. But this is just one 0 0.05 second image. This is nothing to brag about, but I just wanted to show that. Uh, I got it so that when I polar line, it can go straight to Jupiter, and I was like, it was right in the center of the field of view. Yeah, that's and, nice. Which which is beautiful. It was like bang. It was like no problem. Um, and then of course, uh, but I can tell you that I do not. I'm not set up for planetary imaging, so this is just just for the talking point, uh, so that I can. Uh, I do want to get another more um, planetary image uh, type camera, which can take faster um, uh, rate. And then I can do lucky imaging with that, but that will be that's in the future. Um, so what I wanted to show you is the first time I used this polar alignment um, through the ASIR and Exos 2 and the PMC8, uh, what I did is it took me an hour, over an hour, the first time I did it. So basically about the same time as drift alignment. <laughs> um, uh, and and that reason why is I was figuring out it's like you know. How much do you turn the knobs, right? Your altazimuth, how tight, if you loosen one versus tightening the other. That all those little movements, you start to get a feel for how you want to move it to do your polar alignment. Uh, so it took me a long time, but I, I ended up getting it. 
And uh, after I got my alignment, though, what's beautiful about this is you're done because it knows the time. It, what it does is it goes off 60 degrees uh, in right ascension to do the polar alignment. And that's how, and it has your date and time from your, your smartphone. And what happens is you don't have to even do anything after that. So I was able to go with slew to M33. And here's a, it's a bad picture, but uh, it, it banged center, like dead on. Like after, sure, it took me an hour to do my polar line, but, but bang, it was right on M33. And, you know, this doesn't have any calibration frames or anything, but this is just for the purposes of, you know, hey, I, I'm getting my workflow optimized for equatorial. But so this was very happy. And then here's my helix, uh, helix uh, nebula image. Again, basically bang on center. Um, and you can see a little bit of left, right, but it's close to the horizon. So that's, that's expected. Um, here's uh, the Crescent Nebula. Uh, same thing. Crescent Nebula is directly overhead at this time of the year. Uh, it's in Cygnus. So basically, uh, now I'm able to take advantage of the, the um, you remember my earlier pictures of the Crescent Nebula, which were actually better on my Alpha Azimuth. But that was earlier in the season when Cygnus is just rising on in the east. And, um, and you know, still, but now these are all the building blocks. Now I've got it so that my equatorial is going to directly, beautifully centered. And this is only a 30 second image um, and stacks of three. But uh, hey, I got the Crescent Nebula directly overhead. So now I can get all those juicy objects directly overhead anytime, which makes me really happy. Um, and here, what I wanted to demonstrate to everyone is uh, this, what this, I said, okay, I'm gonna figure out the periodic error, uh, like the, the, the range, right? How much uh, on my image scale, how much it's gonna go back and forth. Because I do not have a, I don't have push uh, PhD guiding. I don't have any auto guiding scope, which, mm -hmm. but, but what's, what's, what I wanted to show here is no declination drift. This is a two minute exposure. And you can see the star moving left to right yeah. over over two minutes, which is what you'd expect with periodic error. So uh, this is all again part of the learning, the journey, and understanding why do you need uh, periodic error correct? Why you need a polar? Uh, um, it's not polar. Why you need a uh, a, uh, a, a a PhD guiding scope? You do. You definitely need to have a guide scope to to compensate for this. But the beauty is you don't have to compensate for declination. The declination drift is all determined by your polar alignment. So if you make a better polar alignment, you can take longer exposures with no declination adjustment. So so uh, this is right, Scott. Do I got that right? Right. Yeah. That's so so this is you know I'm 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 a newbie at, at this, but I now you're only worried about right ascension correction. You know? Exactly. Now I'm only worried about right ascension correction. So I can do 30 second right now out of the box, um, but uh, but I'm going to buy a cheap uh, you know a cheap uh, alignment scope from you know a, from ZWO or something, and just to compensate for for that, and then I'll be able to take like two minute, three minute, five minute exposures based on my polar alignment, and then boy, I'm going to be cooking with gas. You know, I I, I can see it's all coming together now. Um, you know, all the pieces. So I just wanted to show you guys all that. And then um, here's this, uh, you know, for fun. Um, this was uh, Stefan's quintet, a bad picture, but it zoomed in and all that kind of stuff. But what, the, you'll notice in the title, Meridian Flip. When I took this picture, I realized it was upside down. <laughs> well, the reason why is because of the image sensor. When you flip over from the east to the west, uh, your your image sensor is upside down, right? Or, or compared to what it was when you look at it. Uh, so what you need to do is you just need to flip your image. So this, this is the image flipped. So I, the original image actually was exactly inverted of this. So um, that's something that when you're taking your images, <clears throat> if, you're, if you're west going, going over here, if you are east of the meridian, my, all my images will be correct right side up. As soon as I do a meridian flip, the whole image sensor flips upside down because it does a meridian flip. So your any images you take uh, west of the meridian 
are going to, you're going to have to just invert. Not No big deal, but just be aware of that. So this is something I learned. And uh, that was fascinating. No, no big deal. Just, just something to be aware of. Um, and then this is a blue snowball nebula. I was really happy with this one. Um, you know, 7662, this is an Andromeda. You can see some structure. I zoomed right in. This is only like a five second exposure. Oh, yeah. And you can see like, like a neon box inside, inside of the jewel. Yeah, exactly. You can just see them make out the central star. You can yeah. see the neon, neon box. You can see these uh, these jewel greenish on this side, bluish on this Facets. side. Facets, yeah. Really, great. really neat. It's really cool. But but it, again, proving how, look at how sharp this, uh, around this star is. I mean, it's, it's when I get periodic error, when I get the PhD guiding, this is only a five second, so there's no drift, right? But if if I uh, take longer exposures, I can I can uh, get the same type of performance, uh, I'm sure. So um, and then you know there was a gap. If you recall back when I a couple of episodes ago I was doing Cepheus, and um, there was this cave nebula, and I was like, hey, but but Cepheus was is overhead now, so I couldn't catch it with my Altas. Well, here we go. I just popped it in and then just quickly snapped it. Uh, again, nothing refined yet. I'm just playing around with my new capability <laughs> and uh and here it is cave nebula you mm. know 30 30 second exposure uh pretty faint object but it's uh you know it's a good test of directly overhead equatorial 30 seconds with a little bit of image calibration which i needed obviously obviously i was playing with my image train so i have to totally redo my my calibration frames and all that but when i do all that uh this is going to start to look good again and i can access the, the entire sky um, which is going to be great. Um, and then I uh, just wanted to show you uh, my improvement. Uh, just a couple of nights ago on the 11th, uh, I was outside. Uh, we had a little bit of clear night here in Seattle, uh, which very few clear nights now, but I got it in. And I was like, hey, I gotta, I'm going to get better at my polar alignment routine. So I just wanted to show you guys uh, the steps I do now. So first of all, I pointed to the North Star. So, you know, you've got your... Uh, your your leg pointing to the north star, and I in in the ASI Air when you're connected to your Exos 2 PMCA uh, or your mount, you you click on start, go to home basis, make sure that your right ascension and your declination are perfectly aligned so that your your zero hour and zero uh, uh, degrees is or 90 degrees is all set. So you're you're all set 90 degrees uh, uh, declination, and um, your your arrows are lined up for your uh, right ascension. When when you do that, you make sure you you got the home position. Step two is you can go into this PA, which stands for polar alignment in in the ASI Air app. We can click on that. You basically make sure you've done you're in this position, and you're roughly pointed mechanically to the to the uh, north. Pole, roughly and then so you can have enough adjustments to do the the optimus and optimization then what you do is it takes a picture and then it's going to rotate 60 degrees in in uh, right ascension and keep an eye on this clock this is how long it's taking so it's about a minute in now it's calculated now it's what it's done is it's going to do uh, a plate solve after rotating at 90 degrees it's going to see this is going to also check for cone error and, and all those things. So basically, it's going to compare the, the picture it took when everything was aligned to the picture it took uh, this way. So you don't have to look through the polar scope. You just look, use your imager. Then you get this view, which is really nice. Uh, it shows you where the pole is. Uh, the pole is in this blue uh, crosshair, and then you are pointed here. So what you need to do is it's telling you I'm to do my first within a minute I was two degrees off where the pole uh, you know direct uh, directly two degrees off from the pole the true pole uh, celestial north pole and it's telling me what I need to do I need to adjust my my uh, my altitude knob by one degree and my azimuth knob by one degree of course you you don't know what that is you'll get a feel for it and I got better at it just within a couple of nights, but just to show you, then I overcompensated a little bit, but then you can see every time you go, if this is 30 arc minutes, this is one degree, this is 1.3 degrees. This is showing you the distance, or sorry, this is 30 degrees, sorry, this is one degree. 
So the scale is kind of logarithmic. Uh, and once you get this blue inside of that one degree, it's going to zoom in, zoom in, zoom in until you can see. Now we're down to uh, this is four arc seconds and this is two arc minutes. So four arc second circle is here and here. So I am actually the total error in my polar alignment after fiddling around with it for uh, 12 minutes and 43 seconds is less than one arc minute. So within 15 minutes, I got less than one minute, arc minute error on polar alignment. So that is a big improvement over an hour. Uh, and then once I got to this level of error, I was cooking with gas because I was, it gives you a smiley face. You can do, you could keep it tweaking it more and more because depending on how long your exposure you want, uh, you can you can tweak it. But for my purposes, I was just saying it has a smiley face. It's within one arc minute, good enough for now. Let me let me see how it works. And so, you know, as I get better at this, you know, I'm I'm figuring, hey, if I can set up polar alignment within 15 minutes and start imaging, I'm I'm happy. So yeah. here we go. Uh, then it says, I, I said, let's go to Andromeda. Let's go to M31. I can go anywhere now with an equatorial mount, which is nice. I don't have limitations. So it's like, okay, let's just go to M31. Bang, bang, bang. It's loose to the position. Uh, again, keep an eye on the time. So here we are. This is 9:51. I was finished. A polar alignment at 9:51, and then look at this. It does a it does a slewing. Then it it validate what it does. It takes a picture. This is what's beautiful about this. It takes a picture. It does a plate solve, and it centers, and it actually does some adjustment on the mount. So you have perfect pointing accuracy with this. Hmm. It will. It, it, it it's like you don't have to worry about cone error or anything because what it will do is it will take an image. It has enough of a database. It, 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 it does a plate solve. It does some little tweaks on the mount because it's talking directly to the PMC-8. Uh, you'll get all the, the perfect uh, alignment. And then target is centered with, and then you go finish. And look at this. I got a preview of the Andromeda Galaxy Bang Center within one minute after polar alignment. Yeah, that's and very helpful. I mean, this is wonderful. This is what I've been looking for, and this is what I am so happy to share uh, in my last episode <laughs> live. Uh, but, but I, of course, I'll continue to share more progress because I'm going to be getting, uh, you know, a tracking, a uh, uh, sorry, what do you call it? Um, a scope, a, a little uh, guide scope. Guide scope. Thank you. I, I've been struggling for that name the whole time. Yes, guide scope. <laughs> I, I, I need to get a guide scope. Um, so yes, exactly. So once I have that guide scope, then you can imagine, right? Then I don't have any more uh, periodic error because I can use PhD. Right. Um, and then, so yeah, and then this is the control for, I can control the mount from here. I can I can tweak it and all that. Then here's my image. Look at that. That's that's uh, my, that's my, third, that's my 30 second image. So here you go. This is how I end. There's yeah. my 30 second image. I'm so happy. Look at how round those stars are. This, yeah. is even with, this is without any uh, PhD, right? And uh, we have uh, CFID, the CFID variable in. Uh, yeah, in yeah, we already know where it is. It's right. It's right here. See, it's yeah. right there. <laughs> yeah. You just follow this chain of stars. Oh, that's right. That's right there. Yeah. The little and, star and, right there. Yeah, it's right there. They're trying. That's so cool. Yeah. So, so basically, uh, it's uh, yeah. So I just wanted to show everyone. Here we are. Within a short time, within five minutes, I have this image after polar alignment, and it, the polar alignment took me. Uh, 15 minutes and I'll get better of course at it and I can imagine in the future when I have the guide scope and I take longer exposure I'm going to have to make more accurate polar alignment but I'll get so good at it I'll know exactly what accuracy I'll need and then and then uh, and then of course I now I now that I got this sorted out and I basically have made my image train permanent uh, I'm going to redo my calibration frames because you can see the big netting and stuff but it's uh, you know it's getting there. So, so thank you everyone. Um, it will be continued. The Camstronic Sky Survey will be continued, but it won't be live anymore. Uh, some you know I'll I'll find some way to uh, you know keep in touch with everyone here. Um, and then uh, I just it, it's all about enjoying the journey. Make sure you know if you feel like there is stress uh, at home at work or or uh, anything. Uh, make sure you enjoy your astronomy uh, sky survey or your, your your journey of the astronomy and exploration, both with visually and all your equipment and everything. 
it's all about enjoyment. If you're not enjoying it, uh, you need to rethink and, and take it take it at a different pace, you know? That's um, right. and, and it's because the, the universe isn't going anywhere. <laughs> and we're not going anywhere either. So I will be, I, I've made a really great friends uh, in this community. I, you know, this is great. And I will definitely keep in touch. So uh, thanks, Scott. I really can't thank Cameron, you enough. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. Um, your contribution to... Uh, our programs has been astounding and, uh, you know, uh, we will um, um, continue to build out your page so that people can go back and review all the wonderful information from your 20 episodes of uh, Cam Astronomy. Um, and uh, of course, anytime that uh, you want to contribute to any of the programs, uh, stick your head in for any reason, you're always welcome. <laughs> you're always Thank welcome. You. Absolutely. Uh, we have some very nice um, um, comments here, which I'll read some of them, uh, as many. Uh, let's see. Jeff Wise had, uh, let's see. Talking about cameras. Uh, Jeff Wise says, cams work made a big difference in my journey. Um, Beatrice Hines, indeed, Jeff. Cam did uh, help me understand the Sky Safari Pro much better. I never knew that this program has even much more potential than I thought. Um, Jeff Wise, again, thank you for all your tr your tremendous contribution. Uh, same from Beatrice. Um, and uh, Harold Locke, Cameron has been an awesome help. Uh, uh, help me learn and getting my star legs. Norm Hughes, Cam the man, the legend, has done a superb job with this project. Oh, thanks everyone. Yeah, and there's more, there's more of course. Guys, thank yeah. you so much. Uh, Cameron, thank you very much too. Uh, it was awesome. Uh, it's not goodbye, but uh, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, he, he will be uh, continuing on with his work, his journey and, uh, um, and we'll see you next time, Cameron. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. And keep looking up and enjoy the journey. Enjoy the journey. That's right. It's, it's a That's wonderful right. journey. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So before we go, um, uh, I will say that um, we have one more program coming up uh, this evening, uh, which is uh, Kayla and Aaron's Seven Months of Science, uh, which we are also getting towards the end of her program. But uh, she has the um, uh, one of the mission uh, uh, scientists from uh, the uh, New Horizons spacecraft, uh, which is going to be really exciting, really good. And uh, so I think you'll really enjoy that. And um, that starts at 7 p.m. Central. So that's coming up in just about an hour and a half. So as Cameron says, keep looking up and we'll see you very soon. Hi everyone, this is Terry Mann and I'm the secretary of the Astronomical League and the co-host of Astronomical League Live. We have a special event coming up on October 15th at 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. We're gonna have a kind of Halloween party online. We have quite a few speakers. The first one is one of our regulars, one of our favorites, David Levy and he will be doing celestial incantations. Next up, we'll have Mary Stewart Adams, passing between the worlds under October skies. We've also got Astro Bob, black holes where matter goes to die. And Molly Wakeling, spooky nebula of the night. And John Goss, the master of lunacy, and we do expect that name to stick. Barbara Harris, Algol, the Demon Star. Myself, Aurora, Soul of the Night. 
and we've got Carol Orge, the president of the Astronomical League. We're going to put a wizard hat on him and let him work his magic. So please let me personally invite you to join us October 15th, 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, right here. We hope to see you. Thank you. 